Hi there, my name is Carlo Renato, chiropractor from Sydney, Australia, and PhD candidate in vestibular rehabilitation. I thought I'd take the opportunity to uh, give a little bit of an update at the uh, upcoming event in Helsinki, Finland. Um, I thought I'd get run through some of the content that we're going to be presenting over the one and a half days, and hopefully you'll be able to join us. So this is a, a course, uh, the Managing the Dizzy Patients, a course that I've been running now for several years. Uh, I've been fortunate that I've run it th uh, throughout Australia uh, and parts of Southeast Asia in my first time up to uh, Europe and Northern Europe. Um, this course is really a foundational course, in my opinion, that's something that uh, all chiropractors or physiotherapists should be uh, either trained in uh, and certainly be proficient in at some level uh, with their practice. And whether their practice is a musculoskeletal based practice or a neuro-based practice, there's a lot here that you'll be able to take home uh, and certainly apply in your practice. So I'll run through a few, few of the slides that we're going to be covering. Um, obviously, just a taste of things. Um, and if you have any questions, by all means, shoot them through. So I guess one of the main reasons that we're doing this, uh, that I'm doing this with some of the assistance um, of colleagues in Finland, is we feel that uh, vestibular therapies and vestibular physiology should be a, an integral part of practitioners that uh, manual practitioners that deal with uh, musculoskeletal based conditions we're going to talk about how that uh, how that is um, and I'm a firm believer that if you have an understanding of how the vestibular system works how it interacts with the environment and and uh, particularly our musculoskeletal system you'll be better equipped to uh, either understanding the reasons why uh, issues occur and reoccur and perhaps different strategies in helping these people we're all proficient in you know, soft tissue techniques or manual therapies, and this seminar certainly isn't in any way meant to take away from that, but more to add to it. So think of this as being a, a value add or an adjunctive uh, mode of care and management to patients that come in with um, not only dizziness conditions, which is obviously what this seminar is about, but the premises is really for a lot of musculoskeletal based conditions as well. We want to provide a very, um, uh, the course provides a very contemporary evidence based approach so you can uh, have confidence that what I present is what's best literature, what is current guidelines um, in many professions, uh, manual care professions, in managing patients with dizziness conditions. Um, the topics that we're going to cover are many and varied. Uh, obviously, we'll go through an introduction. We'll talk about the vestibular neurophysiology. And in my opinion, this is something that's often overlooked. Unless you understand how areas connect, how the inner ear connects with the eyes and how the inner ear connects with the spine and vice versa, you will unlikely have a grasp of how these systems interact and how you can use them for both assessment and for management. We'll go through a list of typical dizziness conditions that we will likely see in practice. Um, history taking is a great and um, very informative way of bringing down a very broad topic with patient symptoms into one or two differential diagnoses. And through a series of questions, we can do that. We'll go through vestibular assessment. Uh, we'll certainly spend a lot of time on BPPV, which is probably the most common um, dizziness, peripheral dizziness condition that um, we're likely to see in practice. So we want you to be proficient with all the different subtleties in that. We're going to talk about vestibular rehab and how a one-size-fits-all approach is not something that we should be using. And we're going to talk about cervicogenic dizziness because as manual care practitioners, in particular chiropractors, we see in practice how the neck influences, a problem with the neck can influence um, someone's sense of balance and visual stability. But the same way around is that when there's an issue here, we can get issues with the neck as well. We want to see that, that link. So we, we always start with why is it that we're looking at this? And, and prevalence of uh, dizziness in practice is quite high. Uh, but unfortunately, our management is not great when it comes to issues that relate to the inner ear. Um, various studies have looked at the effectiveness of... Um, oh, sorry, my apologies. Have looked at the effectiveness of uh, chiropractic as it relates to dizziness conditions. And generally, we do quite well. Um, however, in, we do well compared to other professions. However, the majority of that improvement comes from musculoskeletal type of impairments that have contributed to people's dizziness. When it comes to inner ear issues, so when the patient presents with dizziness, 
and it's because of an inner ear problem, chiropractors do a very poor job relative to other professions in helping manage it. We tend to look at the neck and the neck only. Now, that's not good. You know, if someone comes to our practice, we want to be able to help them as best as we can or refer them to the right people. But if we're taking a one-size-fits-all approach to helping people with dizziness by looking at their neck, then we're going to overlook a lot of um, potential um, misdiagnose them, we're going to mismanage them, and, and that's not a great, favorable image for our profession. So we're going to spend a lot of time in this seminar in looking at not just the neck, but really what's happening in the inner ear and how we can be better equipped to be able to understand, diagnose, and manage people with inner ear-based issues as it relates to dizziness conditions. Uh, and that obviously happens with, um, it always starts with an understanding of the neurophysiology, which is why um, why I said we will spend some time talking about, we'll talk about the different conditions. Uh, history and diagnosis will give us a lot of, um, a lot of um, insights as to what's causing it and how we can prescribe a very tailored exercise program to help them. Um, what I love about the vestibular system is unlike, well, most, pe most people aren't aware that the vestibular system um, develops fully at age four and a half months in utero. So even before a baby's born, four and a half months in utero, the vestibular system is at full maturation or maturity size, which is about one centimeter cube. Unlike any other system in the body, any other neurological system in the body, the vestibular system is fully developed at four and a half months gestation. Hopefully that imparts the level of importance um, and influence it has over a growing body and a developing body. So we see this with a lot of our kids uh, and we certainly see this with adult populations as well. So um, don't underestimate the importance of the vestibular system, which is why I have a, an affinity, I guess one of the reasons why I have an affinity for it. Um, we'll dive into the vestibular system from a microscopic to a macroscopic level. We'll dive into how these, uh, these hair cells in our inner ear detect movement and how that relates to activation of our nerves in our ear um, through pathways through our brain stem up through our eyes and controls our eye movements as well as our spinal movements as well. And it happens at these very uh, small macroscopic level. And we'll talk about this and we'll obviously relate it to what we see in practice as well. But, you know, this is one of the most, most important slides I talk about initially is it talks about that connection between the inner ear and how through various pathways connects our eyes and connects our spine. And that spinal control is something that we see in practice, but we're probably unsure as to how it connects to the inner ear and to the eyes. Well, we're going to break that down for you as well. Um, and obviously that descending influence from the uh, vestibular system uh, contributes to our vestibulospinal reflex. And we'll talk about how uh, that can control uh, various spinal conditions uh, from scoliosis to poor proprioceptive based um, conditions and how is it that as chiropractors or physiotherapists or manual therapists that we can influence this system as well. And the take home message, uh, and I go through, through throughout my uh, course, uh, we'll, we'll go through a, a level of content, we'll stop, there'll be a take home message that's really the nuts and bolts. We'll do a little practicum, a little workshop, whether it be a physical practicum where we do some manual um, assessments or therapies on, on our colleagues, or we discuss some of the, con the theoretical content. So you, so you can walk away with this seminar knowing, uh, having a really good understanding of uh, what we've presented. Uh, we talk about dizziness conditions. We talk about the difference between a peripheral disorder, which involves the inner ear and the nerve, to one that affects the central disorders uh, or central systems, brainstem, cortical, and so on. We look at medication and its influences on conditions we go through conditions like Meniere's, vestibular migraine, neuritis, labyrinthitis, amongst many others as well. That you you will you may or may not come across in your in your practice, but at least you'll be up to date with what they mean and what to do with them. We're going to spend a lot of time on history. I, I feel that history you can almost get ninety percent of the diagnosis uh, of a dizziness complaint by asking the right questions. So we're going to go through the series of about five or six questions that you can ask. That basically by the end of those series of questions and a, and, a, and a form that I'll give you that can form part of your intake form, you can go through this. You'll be you're going to go. It's a long way into providing um, clues as to what's happening and how you can better help these patients. Um, and that leads us to like an algorithm. So there'll be a series of questions that you ask 
and based upon an algorithm approach to the, the answers. Um, a series of these questions will lead to, you know, it could be a, a labyrinthitis, or it could be a cardiac arrhythmia, or it could be a BPBV um, syndrome. Whatever it may be, you'll be able to get this uh, pretty quickly. And again, we provide these algorithms for your, uh, for your reference as well. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of time on vestibular assessments. Uh, we're going to go through um, uh, an auditory assessment. We're going to go through an ocular motor assessment. And we're going to use fairly low-tech bedside examination skills. So whilst some people may have the high-tech equipment that may cost you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, we're not going to talk about that. We're going to use very cheap, uh, reliable, but effective way that you can uh, use um, your either your observation skills or very low-tech equipment in your office to better um, help define what the, the problems are. And, and looking at the eyes are, are a huge part of vestibular assessment. Uh, we're going to look at nystagmus and we're going to go through the different types of nystagmus. We're going to go through the pursuit and saccade systems. We're then going to go into more head uh, mobility or vestibular based assessments, uh, which can include dynamic and static visual acuity, the vestibular ocular reflex, which is obviously my um, an interest that I have because it's what my PhD is all about. And we're going to talk about post head shake nystagmus as tools for vestibular or ocular motor assessment. And we're going to break these down. We're going to talk about the efficacy of it. We're going to talk about how to do it. We're going to do practicals um, that relate to it. So you walk out with a good understanding of what it means, how valid is it, when to use it, and how to do it properly. And really the goal of that is so we can ascertain whether it's a peripheral central lesion because the management of that both acutely and chronically matters a big, uh, has a huge bearing on what, uh, how that pass, uh, patient passes through your practice. We need to understand whether it's an acute or chronic problem, uh, which side it's affected, is it the inner ear or which part of the inner ear is affected, is it neurological or structural, which uh, direction of the nystagmus is involved, uh, and is critical care required? And all these questions will be answered by really understanding how the eyes move. So we're going to spend a lot of time on how to do that. We're going to spend time on balance and postural control testing, which is really that vestibulospinal. So um, there are some basic tests and there are some more advanced tests that we're going to be doing. Again, low tech or you can go high tech if you want. We're going to discuss the pros and cons and merits of all of those as well. We're going to move, then move on with that understanding and we're going to be testing each other. Once we've got that understanding, how do we implement it in our practice? How is it that vestibular rehabilitation can be applied successfully and integratively into a chiropractor's or physiotherapist practice? Uh, even if they're not doing neuro-based um, uh, consults. And, you know, our approach is always going to be, where are, the, where are the issues? What are their symptoms? What, what are their history? What is, what's their history telling us? What's their physical examination telling us? And based upon that, we then say, okay, well, is it a spinal-based issue? Is it an inner ear-based issue? Is it an ocular issue? Or is it a combination of those? And then our goal is to go, okay, well, where's our priority? How do we recalibrate these, the mismatch of these sensors to have it such that the patient feels more centered and balanced and their symptoms obviously and lifestyle improves as well. Okay, we're gonna talk about how to formulate a therapeutic plan and how to titrate it specifically to the patient so we don't exceed the metabolic capacity, which is something that in the literature that there's very little references or recognition of that. But we certainly wanna apply that and we'll talk about how we can do that. Um, we then move on to managing patients with BPBV because understand that BPBV is probably the most common peripheral vestibular condition that's likely to walk into your practice. And most people think, okay, we'll just do the Dix Hall Pike maneuver and then the Epley's maneuver. I can tell you now that's going to work for a percentage of your patients, but it's going to work. It's not going to work for many of them. There are so many different types. Um, and we talk about cupulolithiasis, we talk about canal lithiasis. And you need to know the differences between these. Is it an anterior, posterior, or lateral canal involvement? Is it the left or is it the right? Is it bilateral? Is it contaminated in one canal with the other? Is it a chronic or an acute? There are so many permutations that we need to break through. And again, it's, it's in our interest that we understand this. And we're going to spend a lot of time um, breaking this down. And then finally, we talk about cervical spine and its influence on um, dizziness. 
And we, often, we see this in practice. We know that when someone's got a, a bad neck for whichever reason, that it can contribute to their dizziness. We manage their neck um, through manual care or whatever it might be, and, they, and their dizziness or balance symptoms improve. We see this inherently. But can you explain it? Um, and this is one of the slides in which we go through and explain the neurology behind it. And a lot of the work that I, I'll source and reference uh, is through a colleague, uh, Julia Trelevin, based in University of Queensland um, in, in Australia. She's done a lot of work on cervicogenic dizziness and how it can contribute to this. And so we're going to highly reference her work amongst others um, in, in what we do here. Uh, again, one of her papers that talks about um, sensory motor dysfunction that relates to poor neck and how we and how it influences poor posture, pain, uh, inner ear function, uh, or integration of the inner ear function, this this uh, ocular motor function, uh, and other aspects as well. So we're going to look at um, we're going to break those down. We're going to look at how we can assess those as well. Um, a lot of time we spend on uh, proprioception, or, uh, proprioception or joint position errors as it relates to neck dysfunction, uh, most researched in the whiplash cohort of patients. So we're going to talk about that, how it relates to what we're talking about and, uh, and how we can use it in our care as well. And we'll have some of the lasers and posters on hand that we can use um, uh, for both in the um, workshop as well as for what you can take home as well. We're going to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, we're going to look at other um, neuromotor aspects of spinal function. Uh, we're not going to show you how to do a, an adjustment, but we're going to look at more the contemporary way that we can look at how the spine works and what happens when it doesn't work. So again, you can add this to your uh, current armory of assessments and treatments, because obviously what we assess and if we find a dysfunction, guess what? We're going to turn that into a therapy, and we'll talk about how we're going to do that as well. We're also going to talk about how to differentiate between an ocular, vestibular, and a cervicogenic-based problem. Um, and we'll, we'll break those down and, and how you can easily apply them in your practice as well. Okay, And we'll talk about some of the um, sensory motor retraining programs that, again, uh, Julie Trelevin and co. have developed. And we'll use some of those references that when it comes time to you to write to medical practitioners about what you're doing, you've got some good armory, good sources of literature that supports what we do and and how we do it so you know we'll, we'll talk about those as well so look that's it um we're obviously that's you know, a long-winded way of going through some of the content but i'm excited by it um june 8 to 9 uh, helsinki we start friday afternoon run through all day saturday um, we've got a great crew of people looking after us and we'll be there in attendance i certainly look forward to seeing you guys there go to the website www.brainhubacademia .com.au. I'll put a link on the bottom. And we look forward to seeing you there. Um, bye for now. Cheers.